thank you guys so much for coming. Um, this panel is really special to us. So uh, the festival has a nonprofit arm that we have just renamed the Syndication Project. And at the heart, when we started, when Kate and I started the festival, it was really about storytelling. It was about love for TV. It was about the power of television and how it can really open hearts and change minds and change viewpoints and allow you to see something that you may not experience in your daily life and really understand different cultures and different people and different storylines. Um, and so we're kicking it off this year. It's been going through a few transitions, but we're really going to take it this year and work on spreading stories and making sure that untold stories become part of actual television storylines. So it's really exciting for us to start with this panel. Um, I'm very excited to introduce Natalie Abrams, who is going to be moderating. Hello, ATX, how's everybody doing? Good, good. I'm Natalie Abrams, senior writer at Entertainment Weekly, and I love television. TV has this unique ability to make you feel like characters are speaking directly to you, going through the same experiences as you and helping you navigate those murky waters along the way. Shows are able to do that most of the time because writers are drawing from their own experiences, from heartbreak to death, dating, illnesses, missed opportunities. Writers are always encouraged to write what they know because that experience means they have a deep well to draw from. So we've gathered a great panel of writers and executive producers to get the scoop on the challenges of drawing from their own lives. So from the middleman, the hundred and lost, Javier Grillo Marks Watch. From How I Met Your Mother, The Goldbergs, and the upcoming Netflix comedy, Atypical, Rabia Rashid. From Life Unexpected, Bates Motel, and Casual, Liz Tiglar. And from Friday Night Lights, Parenthood, and Game of Silence, David Hudgens. So there are about a million semi-autobiographical -autobi shows, uh, lots of comedy specifically. Why do you think that is? Why does it lean more towards comedy than drama, you think? Now? Um, well, I don't know. I, I, think, I, think, I think drama has to be, I don't know, I might be making a generalization, but um, drama has to be so big now. Um, I almost think in some ways comedy is the new drama <laughs> in terms of uh, what, you know, I, I look at like a show I did, Life Unexpected, you know, however many years ago we did that, eight years ago, that was a drama. Now it would be like, oh, a foster kid gets a, a you know, reunites with her parents who had like a one night stand in high school. It'd be like, for it to be a drama, it'd be like, and they're international spies, <laughs> and they're on a bridge that's burning, and the world's about to end, and, you know, militias come, I don't even know. Like, that just would never fly, I, I feel like, as a drama. So for those of us who like those stories, um, you know, maybe, maybe we've moved into comedy, the dramedy, the kind of half hour drama format. Um, I don't know. That, that's at least my experience. But I'm going to be selling Bridge Burning Militia Foster Kid <laughs> to NBC this year. I don't you know guys, what you're talking don't about. don't take that. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, I, I think it's also because life is kind of hilarious. And, <laughs> and so when you are taking it from your own life, like I tried on like eight outfits this morning. And of course I picked the shortest dress and I'm sitting in the lowest chair. <laughs> like, it's funny. Life is kind of just... So when I do take things from my own life, it just, my show is not, it's, it's sort of what you were saying, it's not uh, the show that's coming out on Netflix, it's not what you would typically think of as a comedy, it's about a kid with autism, um, but it's really funny. Hilarious. Yeah, <laughs> it's really funny. Yeah, can you talk about that a little bit? That's drawn from your own experiences with your family, right? It is so, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, I have a family member who's on the spectrum, but also I know that the show is sort of about how no one's normal, and I definitely know that feeling. I have uh, a Pakistani dad and a white mom, and I grew up in northern Vermont, so <laughs> no one was like me. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's more just the sort of theme of everybody feeling not normal is something I really 
really connect with, especially now. <laughs> you know, the, the, I, I, the Middleman is a show about a superhero who fights zombie fish and Mexican wrestlers and, uh, and, and uh, vampire ventriloquist dummies. Um, and, and it's probably, you know, the most personal and, and completely autobiographical thing I've ever written because I actually assiduously avoid writing about my life as much as possible. I was um, just saying that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, but, you know, when my friends back home watch it, they, they say it's like we hung out with you for an hour. You know, and which is a credit to the writers on the show who were able to internalize kind of my worldview so quickly. But, you know, the, 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 the show is really specifically not about maybe what I've lived, although the main character was a Latino nerd uh, or a Latina nerd. Um, but but it's really about how like you see the world, you know, and when when you're a showrunner, whether whether you like it or not. And it's usually more fun when you don't and you try to avoid it because then all sorts of crap comes out. But it's like being a showrunner is basically and being a show creator every show, the show, every episode of a show is a psychotherapist couch for you, you know? So whether you choose to write about your life specifically or not, all of your crap's gonna come out because there's just so much pressure and your filter goes, the first thing to go is the filter. So, so you know, with something like, like, like The Middleman for me, it's like, no, I'm, I, you know, th there is nothing in my life that indicates that I could be a guy who looks like Chris Evans and fights zombie trout. But at the same time, um, you know, the, 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 the way that those characters express themselves and the general absurdity of the world is, is about as close to how I see the world as anything that I've ever written, you know? Yeah, I'm curious. I want to go back to Life Unexpected for a second here because that is drawn from your real life experience of, of being adopted. Mm -hmm. When you were creating that show, how, like, what was that? process like was it a little bit cathartic for you um yeah I think it was um like retroactively cathartic which I guess is what catharsis is but <laughs> but um <laughs> but I, I when I when I pitched it you know I had I had gone on a show and and my agent had negotiated like a blind script deal which means you could write a pilot about something and maybe if you sell it they'll pay you and it was all very exciting and um I honestly didn't think it was drawn from my life at all like I just can't kind of pitch this show and and a pr producing you know a director and producing partner came on board um, a producer Mary Beth Basil who ended up becoming a, a dear friend but um, it wasn't until literally we were like hiring writers after we had written the pilot shot the pilot we're hiring writers waiting to get a pickup and then in the middle of it she was like this is kind of about you and I was like what <laughs> and then I realized yeah of course it's about me like I'm an idiot um, because I was like it's so narcissistic writing about yourself as if your story is so important but I realized that it was you know it my experience was not the same as the main character um, Lux's experience played by Britt Robertson it was it was just the unknown of who your parents are, you know, being an adopted kid, I think I, I think I always had this fantasy. I was, I was adopted. I was born in D.C. and and it was, you know, 1975. And by the time I kind of understood that I was adopted, it was the 80s, and I was living in Dallas. And I was like, what if Nancy Reagan is my birth mom? And <laughs> my parents were like, she's not. And I was like, but how do you know? Like, then who is? And they're like, we don't know. And I'm like, then it's Nancy Reagan. She's the only woman in D.C. we know. Um, and uh, you know, I was very adamant. About about this um, so I think it was I, <laughs> it's not but anyway I think it was just this fantasy and this is unknown and and honestly until I actually um, I mean I kind of did it I guess I did it right before life unexpected really started I I decided to just once Mary Beth was like this is kind of about you I was like oh well I guess I should just figure out who my birth parents are so I figured it out and it wasn't Nancy Reagan. Um, was it Patty Davis? And, no, it wasn't <laughs> Patty Davis. <laughs> but um, it, you know, it, it, the the whole experience did end up being strangely cathartic. And I think um, you know, I think the fun of doing the show was was kind of discovering that. And then, of course, just you know, even if even if you're not doing like big cathartic things, it's like just all the little the little details that you put in are, 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 you know, someone's like, oh, that's our high school PE teacher. Or, oh, the, the, you know, it, it's just fun. And, and it, it's true what you're saying, like you can't help but kind of splay your guts out because you're sitting in the writer's room and it's like, you're not sitting in a writer's room talking about how great it's going. You're sitting in a writer's room being like, okay, here's the like terrible thing I did. And then next thing you know, that's an episode. <laughs> Uh, David, for Parenthood, you drew uh, a lot of inspiration for Christina's breast cancer story uh, from your sister who passed in 2001. How difficult was that for you? It was um, it was very difficult, actually. But we had, uh, 
Look, I don't have a, I don't have a franchise on breast cancer. Um, uh, you know, there were several people in the writers' room who'd had experiences with it, including Kadams, um, whose own wife uh, was a survivor. So Jason and I had been talking for a couple of seasons about let's do a story about breast cancer. You know, boy, that'll really get the viewers in. That'll entertain people. <laughs> um, and so, but I, I mean, I'm being somewhat facetious, but we did have long conversations about how do we tell the story where it doesn't, you know, depress the shit out of people. And we decided we would do it with Christina because we thought that character was the best character and that actress was the best actress to do the show, to do the story. And we decided, you know, I, I mean, we went to Monica Potter, by the way, she was all in. She said, I'll shave my head, I'll do whatever it takes. Um, and we just started writing the story and it became very, uh, I mean, catharsis is a good word, and you're in the room and talking about your personal experiences. Oh, yeah, that happened to me, too. So um, we told the story, and it was eight episodes, and um, it's, one of my, it's one of my favorite, you know, stories from that show. I want to go back to the middleman for a second, because okay. we, we emailed before, uh, before the panel so I can get a couple of their stories. Uh, they were all very juicy, so I'm hoping to get them <laughs> all to talk about them throughout the panel. Javi, you mentioned that there was a specific storyline on the middleman that you had written that had to do with your experiences on Lost. Yeah, um, so, you know, in, in apropos of the, the, the issue of catharsis, you know, the, the, I wanna foreground this by saying that when I think, and, and the episode of the middleman we're showing uh, tomorrow actually has to do with that story, which is just mortifying to me, because I honestly, all it does, I don't feel cathartic, catharsis when I t write about my shit, it just makes me more depressed that it happened. So <laughs> it, it's just, it's, it's really just a, you know, so which is why I try to do other things like, Right on the Dark Crystal, which is about you know a planet that's been invaded by turtle raptors from space. Um, but um, no, so so I had so I had quit Lost after the second season, and you know this Lost in its first few seasons, it it ruled the world. It was like we won an Emmy, and it was this extraordinary sort of experience that 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 is a really once in a lifetime thing. I, th I think um, if you're lucky enough to hit on that, and I had quit the show for a number of reasons. Um, and and you know nobody nobody quits a show that it, you know it was it was an, uh, an amicable enough parting but nobody quits the most popular Emmy award winning show in television because gosh we just peaked and why not <laughs> you know I mean so it was obviously something that was fraught and you know there, there was a story in that's told in the book Bright Lights Big City where where Jamie I think his name's Jamie Conway the, the character the main character had been dating a supermodel and then or a model and then after they broke up she got signed and became a supermodel and she was in billboards everywhere in the city and I remember the the the, the years after I had worked on Lost you know it was sort of a succession of shows that when I went to, this is a long, I'm sorry, I'm being really tedious, but um, when I went from working, fr from working on Lost to working on Medium, it literally went from I love that show to my mom loves that show, you know? <laughs> and, and it was like every time a new season of Lost came out, it was like that feeling, oh, that bright lights, big city feeling, oh, there's my supermodel ex-girlfriend, you know? So, so we needed to give Wendy Watson, the main character, a boyfriend, and, and, and I came up with this, with this story idea about a guy who'd been in a band, and he'd written a song for the band, and the song became the band's biggest hit, and then he had actually quit the band. Uh, before the song, before the song hit, so like he's sort of haunted by this thing where like people are constantly, you know, like like she googles him and finds out that he was like the the the, the guitarist in this band, and then like, and and it was very specifically and very directly like a reflection on what it's like to leave the biggest thing. Like when Lost won the Emmy, Leonard Dick, who was another producer on it, turns to me and goes, "You know, the first line of your obituary just got written." You know, and I was like, oh, this is okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a good one. It's good, right? I'm, you know, it's not splitting the atom. I'm not Enrico Fermi, but it's nice to be one of the Emmy Award winning producers of Lost. And then you lose that, and it's like a relationship. It's like a, it's like a marriage. It's like a, it's like a divorce. And then when you're, when you're sort of looking at it, dominating the landscape, the pop culture landscape in such an ubiquitous, ubiquitous way, the story was a reflection of that. And I got to tell you, I'm, I'm looking at tomorrow with dread. I'm like, oh God, we're going to see that on a big screen now? Oh, Jesus Christ. And it does feel really narcissistic. And it just actually, I'm not entirely certain that catharsis was reached. Maybe I didn't write it well enough. Wait, can I ask you, can I ask you a question about season two lost? Yeah. Were you there the day that the What About Brian writers came in to have cake? Do you remember that? This? was season three. I didn't, I didn't have that. I didn't no, have that no, experience. No, no, two, two. Two? Really? No, that, I wasn't there when that happened, no. Oh, okay. Because I, 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 I thought heard, maybe that's why you quit. I've heard about the great cake incident, <laughs> you know, uh, that, that was sort of, yeah, but no, I, I was not there for that. I, I believe that was the third season. There was a cake. Oh, maybe it was the third season. Can I tell the cake Go, incident? Please, there tell the cake There was a tragic story. cake incident. So Lost, you know, became Lost, and we were on What About Brian, which 
We, lo you know, the writers on that show, we loved it. Um, JJ obviously oversaw those shows. Um, not as much, what about Brian? And um, we got told one day that it was JJ Abrams' birthday, and so we needed to come over to the Lost Writers' Room for cake, and we were like, oh my God, we're going to the Lost Writers' Room, this is the best day of our lives. We were like, maybe we'll have pen pals, maybe it'll be like, I'm Liz Tiglar, and maybe Liz Sarnoff could be my pen pal, and like, we're so excited to go over there. We get there, we wait forever, JJ comes, we sing happy birthday, the cake is out, and then JJ leaves, and then the last writers were like, there's not really enough cake for what about Brian? You're gonna have to go back to your writer's room with no cake. And we were like, what? <laughs> so we slunk back they to our writer's room. They could just cut smaller pieces That's of cake. That's what we said. We were like, but you invited us. We were like, how yeah, is no, this No, if possible? I'd been there, that, I, you, they would I have just cut the cake smaller. I thought maybe you drew smaller. the line. You were like, you guys, that is not how you treat I people have... on a less successful show. <laughs> sure, they have a two, but... <laughs> Anyway, that was what happened. I would have totes resigned in, pro in, pro in protest. All right, well, I support you. <laughs> so when drawing uh, from your own personal experiences, can you talk about walking sort of that fine line between fiction and reality? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, well, sometimes people ask me, there's, there's five main characters in my show, and sometimes people ask me who, which one I am. And uh, I think I'm kind of all of them. And I think... Uh, a lot of drawing that line is about sort of, and, and it is narcissistic, but finding yourself in those characters, in, in different characters. Like there's a, there's a sister who I didn't realize I, wa I was her, but I'm her. Like she, she's always taking care of her brother. She's very protective. And uh, I, I have that role in my family to a certain extent. But I also have the sort of, the, the dad is sort of this, uh, this playful, dorky goofball and I have that like it but but they're very specific people and I think I think that I think a lot of it is not being literal with my experiences but being sort of soulful about you know where those characters come from I, I struggled a lot um, with the character of Tim Riggins on Friday Night Lights because I am so sexy in my personal life <laughs> and um, <laughs> I was really worried that, that, that Taylor wouldn't be able to convey that on screen. Um, no, I'm, I'm obviously kidding. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was very cathartic. Uh, Hard but to be it, so miscast. But you know what, what I find about, what I find about um, the line between fiction and reality is a lot of times, for me, it's, 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 um, it's unintentional or maybe it's subconscious or whatever. I'll find that I'm writing a story or I'm writing a character and I'll realize maybe, you know, sometimes when I'm in post, I'm like, holy shit, this happened to me or this has come out of my life. I noticed that a lot with, um, with Coach and Tammy and Friday Night Lights. We, we, would, we were always channeling. That marriage was very unique, I feel like, on television. If you, if you notice, over the course of five seasons, they never really fucked each other over. They had a very solid relationship. And um, my parents had a very... Um, solid relationship too, which I always worried I wasn't going to be a good writer because you're supposed to come from damage. But um, but you know, so I, I think a lot of times you end up subconsciously channeling your own experiences, and then sometimes you make up a character to get back at somebody or <laughs> or, an, or an incident. When we were on at How I Met Your Mother, there was a lot of like uh, sharing dating stories in the room. It, it's that's about ninety percent of being a TV writer, and uh, and. Somebody was talking about this move, this dating move called the Naked Man, which I, I, I mean, it is Go what on. it sounds like. The girl goes to like, you know, do her hair in the bathroom, comes out, and the guy's sitting there naked on the couch. So that was the, the story that we were going to do. And I <laughs> picked that moment very unwisely to go to the kitchen and get some snacks. <laughs> and I came back, and there were four gross, lumpy writers shirtless on the couch <laughs> when I walked in. So yeah, I feel like, uh, yeah, there is a, <laughs> there's a line that you shouldn't cross between fiction and reality. Uh, you know, I, I was talking to Natalie Morales on the set of The Middleman uh, about the story with her boyfriend. And the, and, and the actor who played the boyfriend was there. And, and he was asking me some questions about it. And he said, well, you know, and I, and I finally just said, look, the character is, your character is basically me on my best day. You know, he's me on the day when, when everything comes out witty and funny and all that. And then Natalie goes like, but that's also my character. And I'm like, yeah, pretty much. You're both, uh, yeah, you know. And then she goes like, but, but our characters are having sex. And I'm like, huh. <laughs> Would that my self-esteem were that healthy? <laughs> 
when you include something in a script that's drawn from real life experiences, do you sort of warn loved ones? Like, what is that conversation like? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm struggling with this a little bit right now because I did include, I, I like I said, I have a family member who's on the spectrum and, and he's younger. And so I'm like um, protective of him in his sort of, but there is one speech in the show in eight episodes that is very specifically him. And I'm, I'm struggling with what to do. If I, do I give my family members a heads up or it, it's tricky when it's, when it's, Straight up comedy, I don't usually, and uh, everybody is so self-involved they don't even really notice. But uh, <laughs> but, but with it, I, this one, this one's stumping me a little bit. I, I think Air on the side of warning them too much. Yeah, right. maybe. Have, have loved ones ever gotten upset with you over something you've put into a script? No one's ever gotten upset. Um, a lot of times they they kind of like it. I mean, I have young boys who recently discovered. Sh- they're like, "Wow, you've been writing for a long time, Dad." It's like, <laughs> "Look at this show. You were on the show." I said, "Yeah," and they see a storyline and and um, or, or a reference that that they recognize and they're happy about it. And no one's ever gotten upset with me. How about you? I you know I always consider like um, exes totally fair game. Like that is like you, I can like include it all day long and don't ever feel bad. Um, I did on casual, We I, so I had a, I, I was writing on casual, it was casual first season and I think we were like, we'd written an episode and, and then we had rebroken the one before so we were rebreaking that one. Anyway, we were trying to think of kind of a storyline quickly and I had just had an incident um, an incident with my wife. We were engaged at the time. We'd gotten in like some dumb fight about something. Um, I was in the wrong. But uh, when she walked to take the trash out, which is a nice thing to do, I don't know why. I just, she like walked out the door and I just locked it. Like I just like locked the front door like a maniac. And I was just like, huh. and then I did it. And then once you've locked somebody out of the house, it's really hard to unlock the door to let them back in because now what you've done is like so egregious that unlocking the door seems like almost scary um, because you have to explain why you locked the door in the first place, but you really can't. So anyway, um, we'd gotten through that personally, but then I pitched, I told the story in the room. I was like, you know, it'd be funny. I was like, maybe Valerie should like lock Drew. You know, I had this thing. Anyway, next thing you know, we were doing a story in casual where Valerie locks Drew in the garage and then doesn't let him out for pretty much the whole day. It was like a two episode arc. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, it did. I mean, like we took our time. Um, So anyway, I did feel like I had to come home and be like, I told a funny story. You know, it was a hilarious, you know, and she was a good sport about it, but it definitely, it's in a writer's room. It is, um, I feel like there it is a challenge with spouses because you I mean you know more about you know you you I don't know how to say it like you know people in a certain way in a writer's room that you don't always you wouldn't necessarily know them in real life and like when you have to go to the rap party and like everyone's spouse has come it's almost like awkward like you don't know what to talk about because you're like wait a minute do they know that about this person like I know that about this person but I don't think that Vegas story was supposed to be like public knowledge so you know like whatever it is you're kind of like you're just trying to kind of figure it out so in a writer's room you're so open and like I said you're so exposing the vulnerabilities in all aspects of your life your own and you know your spouse gets dragged into that so it's um so you definitely um you know you have to kind of I don't know, I guess negotiate that line. But the whole idea of a writer's room is that it's a very safe place to talk about kind of your, you know, deepest, darkest thoughts and feelings and and then what comes out of that or or maybe your your scariest things or the most insane, inappropriate things you've done like lock somebody out of the house. Um. Is there a line you draw that you wouldn't put into a script uh, in terms of something from your life where you're like, that's just too far? Yeah. <laughs> well, we wouldn't say it here. <laughs> no, but, uh, but I'll, I'll, t- I'll tell you a story because it's interesting. Um, when when I was early in my dating life, and I was, you know, there was that time in college, and and uh, and and I had this this fight with a with a girlfriend that I was having about whether we could shower together, you know, and that was like a whole thing. Was we gonna shower together or not? What was your stance? Yeah, what side are you pro shower together? Totally. Come on. Don't you want to shower with a naked person? That's not you. It's the best thing ever. It What's actually makes being naked it? with yourself better. Um, What's her, so, what was her argument? Uh, intimacy issues, all sorts of crap. Anyway, so the point is, she told the story to somebody who had a cartoon in the school paper. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then the next time I go see her, 
Um, I, she shows me the the the, the Ohio was it uh, it's Ohio State uh, the Ohio State. Uh, yeah, uh, a school newspaper, and there's a, a really cute cartoon about a boyfriend and girlfriend who are having an argument or whether they should shower together. And then, and then the, 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 the girlfriend's like, well, I don't want to shower together, but I have, a, I have an idea. And then the next panel is that they're both brushing each other's teeth. And it was just so delightful and such a funny romantic comedy moment. And I felt like so violated by that, that like, I, because she still wouldn't shower with me. Um, so it was, and literally, like, I just, so, so I think that there's, you have, you know, you bring you bring that that experience into the writers' room, but I feel like you have a moral obligation to throw as much dirt on it as you can because there's there's the flat, there's the the seed of what you feel emotionally would tell a really great story about how about a universal situation, but then you've got like ten other people in the writers' room who will help you turn it into something that isn't going to make someone out in the world feel violated. And frankly, uh, you know, like like our, it, that early experience was so, and and it must seem very trivial right now. But even as I say it, I can I, I feel that welling up of oh my god, you use that, you know, and I think early enough in my career, I named enough dead people after ex girlfriends and got enough shit for it that like I just decided we, we have a moral obligation to not do this, you know, and n don't name dead people after ex girlfriends. Whatever you do, just don't do it. It's not worth it. Is there anything any of you put into a script you ended up regretting? No. <laughs> I don't think so. Not, not, not for that reason. <laughs> I mean, there are plenty of things I just regret. I'm like, ooh. I regret most of my work on Sequest, but none of it was personal. <laughs> uh, David, I want to talk to you about Game of Silence. Um, this is a lot of that was sort of uh, uh, drew on your own experiences with defending the Boy Scouts of America in sexual assault cases. But while you had your own experience, you also talked with other people and looked to uh, like sort of a panel of experts, right? Right. So, uh, Game of Silence was um, was based on a Turkish show, um, and it was you know my, the point in my career where I decided I wanted to be the guy that did um, a drama about prison rape, um, <laughs> which I thought TV needed. Uh, and so, but. but it, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I had, in my former life as a lawyer, I had represented the Boy Scouts of America, who often got sued for failing to supervise scoutmasters that were alleged to have molested um, Boy Scouts. And it was a year and a half experience that was incredibly depressing, sitting in depositions um, uh, or in the courtroom, listening to this testimony about these horrible things people would do, some of it true, some of it untrue. And it really affected me. I had small boys at the time to the point where they would come home from preschool, and if something was even slightly off, I would say, oh, something's happening at the school. It, but, but so it gave, this is a way of saying that when I decided to do the show, I wanted to talk about child sexual abuse in a very real um, and a very very accurate way, and we spoke to a lot of experts. We had psychi psychiatrists and counselors come into the writer's room and talk to us about the effects and what it does to people, um, just so we could tell the story, you know, honestly and accurately. And, um, and it was, uh, I think it was kind of cathartic. I have to say, you know, having, after having spent all those years um, listening to these terrible Boy Scout stories. Cathartic is the word of the panel. Seems like it. Should be a drinking game. It seems uh, like it. <laughs> uh, if you experience actual cathartic catharsis, drink twice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I'm curious. I've always been sort of curious about this, but if a friend were to tell you a story that you ended up liking or wanting to to draw from, what are sort of the rules there? Take it and use yeah, it and yeah, go with it. Take. Josh Reams, a writer, a showrunner, he has a story that he still has not written. Like, literally, I've been holding on to this story for 10 years, and I'm about to be like, if you do not use it in the next year, I'm putting it as, like, a cold open of a procedural. But then I'd have to write a procedural, so maybe not. But I, it would, I do feel like there's, you know, I, don't, I feel like you kind of can take it and twist it. If someone tells a story in the writer's room, that's fair game. I think it, I, and I think if, if you hear a story from someone who's not a writer, Certainly take it and use it. Oh, sometimes, yeah. sometimes, obviously. But sometimes if it's a writer, maybe I feel a little like... There wouldn't be television without mm -hmm. friend of a friend stories. <laughs> there would not be television. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's 65% that's of what's talked about in the writer's room, you know? And they're probably just talking about themselves but don't want to say it. This oh, friend yes. of mine. <laughs> I, I, this made me think of it. I don't know if it's a direct answer to this question specifically, but I did one time, we were... It was in, at How I Met My Mother again. We were talking about... Um, pets, childhood pets, and uh, there was some storyline about someone's dog died or whatever, and I, was, I, was, I told a story about my childhood pet and the insane lie that my parents told me when they had, when, after 
<laughs> after the dog bit our neighbor and they they had the dog put to sleep but they told us that he became a guard dog at a factory <laughs> <laughs> And to me, it was just kind of funny, but it took me a really long time to figure out. Like, I was in college before I realized what had actually happened to Bunny. <laughs> like, what happened? <laughs> and apparently we asked It was to a go... chihuahua, wasn't it? <laughs> no, it wasn't, but uh, they didn't make the fake factory far enough away. It was, we were in Connecticut and the factory was in New Jersey. So we kept asking to visit. So then my mom created this elaborate death for the dog where he saved the factory but got shot by gunmen. <laughs> like, like it, it was like a bizarre tale. And I was telling this story in the room and it was all funny and fun and it got in the show and it was whatever. And then uh, I, I told my mom, and she just, she just like went pale, and she was so upset that I used this story, and it was like a real, like I was over it, but she was she like she tried her best, and she just, she just like really, I was like I still don't get how a bloody death at the hands of armed gunmen is better than just you know I don't know he went to a farm or something, but <laughs> but it really it, it was like one of those moments where I was like oh I didn't I didn't foresee that this would have uh, this would hurt her feelings a little bit. Uh, now, it's not just about creating stories that are inspired by your own life, but sometimes being assigned a story that just by happenstance mirrors your own life. Uh, can, do, do any of you have one of those experiences? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when, when, uh, when I worked on the first season of Lost, um, I was given the story of the Korean couple. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they, that, they, it, it it's not, wasn't outside of the realm of my competence to write that story, but it was certainly nothing I was familiar with. And um, and I struggled with it a lot because you know I mean look there, there there was already you know a lot of talk about the Jin character and 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 all of that and whether he was stereotypical or not and whether that relationship was sexist or not and all this other stuff and and what I wound up sort of like and and I really just had a hard time empathizing with them because they the language barrier made them feel very alien even though I really was a huge supporter of them having so much of their story be in Korean because to have a primetime show where 30% of it was in subtitled Korean was a pretty great thing at the time. Um, and then, and, and, and as I got to thinking about it, what, what I wound up coming up to was really touching into the memory of what it was like for me coming to the United States at the age of 10 and not having English be my first language. And, um, and you know, whether that story works or not, the, the, in that episode and then in subsequent episodes that I got to write about those characters, the the any scene where you see Jin sort of uh, the the uh, Daniel Day Kim's character struggling with not being understood, and there's one specifically where everybody's sort of yelling at him, and 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 it's sort of done in a very kind of expressionistic way, and that is like pretty much a snapshot of my brain at age 10, moving from you know Puerto Rico to Ann Arbor, Michigan, um, and and of that just horrific feeling of inadequacy that that you cannot be seen or heard or understood and that others don't and that everybody else is sort of clickly clacking at you. I mean, that, that is very specifically that. And it's a story that wouldn't that I wouldn't write in any way other than being assigned a story about a, a Korean couple where the wife is the daughter of a gangster uh, guy. <laughs> so, you know, so it was a really weird way that, that that part of my life came out in television that you can see that in no way has anything to do with my life at all. Anybody else get a storyline by happenstance? I don't, I don't know. I really don't know. I feel like whatever story you get, I mean, it obviously it depends whether it's your show or you're on somebody else's show, but, but you find a way to infuse your newness into it. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's make it kind of specific and, you know, it's like I I can shoehorn like Frito Lay bean dip into like anything I write probably if I work hard enough you know whatever whatever your thing is, and it's not just you as writers that are tied to the material but do you find that members of the cast or crew share their own experiences with you that end up playing into your shows, you know we uh, we had such a great crew on the the show that it, I just did um, for Netflix and several of the people on our crew had kids on the spectrum or kids with special needs and it was so cool some of them like left jobs to come work on the show because they because the subject matter was was so close to them and that was sort of awesome and so yeah we had a lot of that uh on atypical just people coming in and you know someone uh, uh, our um our prop master was has a son on the spectrum and she would she would catch things she would be like that 
this seems a little off or whatever. And it was great. I mean, we had a, a consultant also, but it was, we, we really did use the like, the person power that we had. Yes. I, I think different, I mean, different people run their shows in different ways, but I, I on Game of Silence in particular, but in other, sh in other shows too, um, I like to invite the actors to come into the writer's room at the beginning of the season um, and just, you know, just to sit down and talk. And it, on, on Game of Silence, there's an actor named Michael Raymond James who understood his character from the get-go and he came in and he talked to us with such passion about this character that he literally, it, it poured out of him. At one point he said, I see Gil as a hurricane. He could go left, he could go right, you never know. And we took that in the writer's room. We actually wrote an episode and called it Hurricane Gil. So I've always encouraged um, the actors to, you, you know, you want, you want to be a little bit careful. You don't want them to, you know, you're, you're still creating the character for them, but I feel like you can get so much more out of a character if you do it in partnership. Um, with the actors, and, and they will, they'll pitch stories all the time. Say this happened to me. Um, sometimes you use them. I mean, sometimes they're better than the shit we had. Yeah. that's for sure. You know, when I when I first wrote the Middleman pilot, it was 1998, and I just figured the the main character Wendy Watson was was going to be a, a, a white girl from from Iowa, and that's what I wrote. And uh, and then I was sort of forced by the network to cast a Latina in it uh, against my strenuous objections. Um, it, seriously, because because I didn't want to write rice and beans and papi and somebody who breaks into Spanish whenever they get angry because, as you know, we Latinos lose control of our language skills when we're angry. You know, that happens a lot. Um, so, you know, so I was very opposed to it and the network, you know, and I finally made a deal that as long as I... I said, I will cast any color you like as long as I don't have to change a line of dialogue yeah. in the pilot. And But what happened was, as I got to know Natalie... And she's Cuban, and she's from from Florida, and she has that whole background. That you know, like like basically, I just sort of started working some of my own lat Latino osity into it. But then a lot of it was also hers because I'm not Cuban and I'm not from Miami. So I just figured, okay, well, I guess she's from Miami. <laughs> and then you know, Natalie would tell me a little bit about her family and and so forth. And then that would start kind of weaving its way in because um, she, you know, we 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 I did not intend for the character to be that, and we cast somebody who was that. And you know, and I'm sure that if she had been any other thing, I would have probably talked to the actor about their experience and put that in there so that it would have been comfortable for them to play that, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, now I want to turn it over to you guys. Uh, does anybody in the audience have any questions? I mean, I think in marketing, uh, I mean, I, I, I can't like speak that much to marketing, but I would imagine that you're, you're looking at a show and you're looking for any hook that's going to get people to watch, PR, marketing. Um, and so when someone's w w talking about your personal connection to the subject matter is going to resonate. You know, I'm sure that you're doing that right now as you're talking about the show. When I did Life Unexpected, it was, I mean, I must have told the story that I thought Nancy Reagan was my birth mom like a hundred times because it was like, oh, talk about that. You know, on Casual, the biggest question that Xander Lehman gets asked who created the show is like, where did this come from? And he talks about his um, not anywhere near as codependent relationship <laughs> as on Casual, but he and his sister were very close. They were roommates, they lived together, and she started dating his best friend. And that was kind of the impetus um, for him writing the show. And obviously, it's, evol it's evolved into something very um, fictitious, but you know, certainly when we go out and we promote the show and we talk about it, that's one of the biggest things he's asked and one of the biggest things you know, we collectively talk about. So I think any personal connection um, makes it more marketable. Is that kind of, I don't know if that's exactly. That I, one of the things we found on Parenthood um, was people tended to, to or I, I say we found, I guess the researchers or the network or NBC or somebody discovered was that a lot of people would come to the show and watch it uh, because they felt like they wanted the Bravermans as their own family. So you start, you know, and that wasn't like an intentional personal story we were telling. It's just the way the show was happening, the way it was being written. But the network really took that and used it. I mean, I can remember even some of the promos and commercials for the show. It's like, spend time with the Bravermans, the family that, you know, whatever. <laughs> and it became, and it became, you know, this wish fulfillment thing. Um, 
that that we sort of wrote into. And it, you know, it makes me think it, it, your show is so interesting to me because Max Braverman on on Parenthood. It, going back to your early question, I do remember I would have a little bit of trepidation writing those storylines because I don't have a personal experience. And, and Max was on the spectrum in the show. I don't have a personal experience with that. So every time I got a Max story. I felt some added pressure to oh. get it right, and I didn't want to offend anybody. I was but so mad at myself when I came up with the idea. I was like, God damn it, this is going to be so hard. <laughs> it was so hard. I had to do so much research. Because I do have a little bit of personal experience, but not that age group. And so, yeah, it, I get it. I also, I totally, I just got a text the other day from a friend who said that her 11-year-old daughter just finished all four seasons of The Goldbergs and was crying because it was done. And she was like, are there more seasons coming out? And I, I texted, yes, there are. And she said that she thinks that her daughter wants that family. That's why she, that's why she likes the show, because she wants that Who family. Who doesn't want Bev? I know. That mom is awesome. <laughs> but I, I think there's something, um, it's funny, because I feel like as the more specific you get with these stories and these jokes and these characters, the more relatable it is in a, in a really interesting and surprising way. The, 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 Tiny, tiny story of a um, of a eighteen year old boy looking for love on the autism spectrum for me is su it's such a it's such a relatable thing and it's so specific but it is about like you know looking for love and feeling weird and not knowing how to be a normal person sometimes which I, I feel a lot. Where is he? I, 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 what oh. I was going to say, I think, I think, in apropos of, of a lot of what we're talking, oh, the, the, he's like way in the back there. It's, yeah, that guy. He's, he's like, but he's wearing black, so like you can't see him. No, but what I was going to say, a real just champion, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I wear a lot of black. I don't get seen a lot. Uh, well, hold on, but I was. Uh, 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 well, I don't ask your question. I, I'll. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, we actually went to the first question. I was going to ask. I have a backup question. I was going to ask about uh, how you deal with writing about things that don't come to your brain. Yeah, I once wrote a um, movie called, it, you've never seen it, it never went anywhere, but it was called Werewife, and it was when I was uh, engaged, and the, and you know, I've been married, uh, it's our nine year anniversary, uh, not today, but this is our, around now, and, uh, and, but, and I never had a second of doubt about my husband or whatever, it was, it was, we've been together a long time, but it was still a transition, and I was writing this this screenplay, and I didn't realize what I was doing, but I, I, and I was excited about getting married, but I was writing about, you know, she, she, she gets bitten by a werewolf on her honeymoon and becomes a different person. And obviously the, the movie was about this fear of like becoming dif a different person when you, when you get married, like losing your identity or whatever. But it was also, the, the idea was cooked from the like, uh, the, the, solidness I felt in my own relationship. Like one time I was on the porch with my husband and I was like, if I turned into a werewolf, a werewolf what would you do? He's like, I would just build a big cage. <laughs> and, it, <laughs> and that's what happened in the movie. And, uh, and it, so in, in some ways that movie came from my anxiety about being a different person, but in some ways it came from this foundation of a real strong relationship and just wanting to see that. I, 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 that's a great question. I love stories about joy, and um, I don't know why. Just because they're they're exciting and they're fun to write and they're fun to shoot, and actors get excited when they see a story. On Friday Night Lights, I remember we were we were maybe I don't know, eighteen episodes into the first season, we were tackling all these issues like racism and and it, it was getting very sort of heavy. And one day, Patrick Massett came into the room and he said, "Why don't we do a story about the joy of the game?" you know, what football really is. And it became an episode called Mud Bowl, where um, the team went out and played a game in the middle of a field because they didn't, I forget, I forget what the setup was, but it became literally, the episode was about the joy of the game and playing football. And we shot it in a field and we had the big rain cranes and everybody had a great time. And I've always loved that story. And so on a, on a larger scale, that was a story about joy. But then even the smaller moments, and look, every family, family drama has the, the birth 
you know, the birth of the, of, and so we had, you know, we did stories where, I mean, you know, Tammy had a baby. Uh, I'm sure there were babies born on Parenthood. I can't remember. But even those, those small moments of joy, too, I just, I always, you know, I always thought they were really fun to do. One of my favorite things that we've got to do on, uh, on Atypical was uh, the 16-year-old girl, I get to show her falling in love. And it was so fun to like do just, I mean, it's super uncomplicated, like just moments of that first love for, it was very joyous. And that stuff is really fun to write. Right here. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Well, definitely write a lot. Writing a lot helps you become a better writer. And give yourself deadlines. I, I feel like writers need deadlines. So just on a practical level, write a lot and, and have somebody give you a deadline or you know a friend or if you're super strict with yourself, give your, give your own deadline. But I'd say writing and deadlines is helpful. I think in apropos of a lot of what we're talking about in this panel, you need to, especially in a writer's room, you need to realize that a lot of the time the real magic isn't because you've had a story that you think is so unique to you that it's that, that, that it has to be told. When you create a show or when you're writing on a show, it's very easy to get attached to things. <laughs> the, magic, the magic doesn't happen because something funny happened to you. The magic happens because you bring it into the world and other people embellish it, other people make it better, and the magic stops when you become so attached to whatever it is that you forget that you are in the cat skinning business. You know, and, and the piece of advice that I give to every writer is know your theme and know how to express your theme a billion different ways. And your theme can change over the course of your life. I know that mine has, but it's, it's not, oh, this happened to me, I must write it, and if I don't render it exactly how it happened to me, it's never going to be good. It's this happened to me, and then other people help you make it more universal. And uh, when you go work on shows, it's, all, it's like you figure out how to tell the story of the Hitachi magic wand in the context of Law and Order, in the context of Star Trek, in the context of The X-Files, in the context of Fargo. You know, If Hitachi magic wand is your theme, you're going to write about the magic wand, but the question is you're not just going to work on Hitachi the motion picture, you're going to work on a bunch of different shows, and how do you bring that into every show and help what that show is, what the vision is of its creator and all the other people you work with, turn it into something that's universal. That's the real magic. Attachment to your, um, your need to express only one thing is, is the key to insanity. And that's when you meet people who've been working on the same script for 20 years, you know. Also, TV writing is so cool and so different. And weirdly, there's not, a lot of times, there's not a lot of writing. <laughs> it's, you do a lot of like sitting in rooms, breaking stories. I, I, uh, I went to a party once early on in my career and uh, my friend was like, oh, my, my friend is here and she really wants to be a TV writer. Would you, would you talk to her about it? And so, so I, I thought I was doing such a nice thing and I sat down with her and I went through the whole process. Like this is, first we, first we come up with that, we sit around and we come up with an idea and then we, break, we write the beats and, on the board and then we outline, somebody goes off, whole thing. It maybe took me 10 minutes. And then she, she waits a second and she looks at me and she goes, oh, so you're not really a writer. <laughs> and like, no, that's how, it, that's how it works. But it is. It's such a collaborative process. It's not screenwriting. It's not you're, sitting. You're more like, like a person who's really focused on lunch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it really is like um, you are not, you know, and I, my first job was on Will and Grace, and it was 24 episodes. The last season, it was 24 episodes, and I wrote one. So I spent one week actually writing a script, and then the rest of the time I was in the room pitching jokes or, you know, and it, so it is a different kind. It's a different beast. It, it's almost simplistic to call it yeah. right, <laughs> writing because, and the plus side of that is you get to produce it too. You, you write it, and then sometimes three days later, you're shooting the thing that you just wrote. And you're like, fuck, <laughs> this happens so quickly. Um, so yeah, it is, it's just a different, it's a different kind of thing. I think also um, the, my best advice is probably, well, two things. One, in a room, like take the ball that someone's throwing. Like if you're in a writer's room, nothing is worse than like throwing a ball that no one catches. People are like, eh. <laughs> you know, and you're like, oh. Like, <laughs> so I always feel like just pass the ball around. Like take it and 
take a kernel of what somebody said, even if what they said isn't perfect or you don't want to do all of it. Like, don't be so literal about it. Just kind of take the spirit of it and keep going. And like, it's almost like hot potato and you're like passing the idea around and it's just getting better and kind of gaining momentum. And then the other thing is, if you want to write, take notes defenselessly, which is really, really hard to do. I, like, literally, not even kidding, probably a week ago, I gave a script to my wife to read, and she literally said, this feels like a zany multicam. And I was like, what? Um, and she was like, like I expected it to be more high end. And I was like, what? And then I like laid in bed in a panic, sobbing. Um, and then I was like, well, I guess I have fucking a lot of work to do, and then did it. Then I gave it to someone else who had similar feedback, and then I was like, well, I guess I have even more work to do. So it's like even, it doesn't matter how many pilots you've written, how many shows you've been on, like getting notes sucks, and it's painful, and you need them, and the best thing you can do is not argue with them, and just take them. And that's what I've been doing for the last week. And the script is in much better shape now. Um, so, and it feels good. But I think, I think it's really hard when you get notes. Um, your first inclination is to defend and explain. Um, but don't do any of that. Just listen, take it, and go do them. That's it. It's going to get better if you do that. Along the same lines, too, in terms of the writer's room, never be the person who just pitches a problem. If you pitch a problem, if you see a problem in a story, make sure you have a solution before you open your mouth because everybody sees the problem. Yeah, that's true. I, I don't know if this is where your question was. Due. I, my, my advice is uh, on a very practical level, and whenever I you know, talk to people who ask about how do I break into the TV business, I always say two things. Number one, if you're serious about it, you're going to have to come to LA. This is for television I'm talking about, not features. Um, and number two, I always encourage to say, look, you got to have a good spec. You got to have a calling card. You got to have a sample. And it takes time and it takes effort to sit down and write a spec episode of a television show. But when I'm hiring, I can't make a judgment about somebody's ability to write unless I can look at a spec episode of a show and make a judgment as to whether or not they understand structure and character. And this is what the show sounds like. So on a very practical level, I think the best thing you can do is is, you know, pick your pick your show that you love, write an episode of it that is fantastic and that is reflective of your voice, um, and then do it a second time. Mm -hmm. So if somebody gets interested in you and they read your first script and they say, wow, this, this writer seems interesting, what else you got? You know, then you get a meeting, then you go in and you charm them with yourself and and uh, and you're off to the races. And and a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth yeah. because you won't be right, good right, at right. it until you write the seventh. Right. Well, uh, and I would also say true. have a have a have a spec and have an original piece of material too because everybody likes to read different stuff. Some That's people true. won't read specs and some people, you know, so I would say make sure you have a variety. Yeah, and, and, and look, uh, whatever piece of advice you choose to take, the, only, the, the, the one that matters most is that you never stop writing. Yes. You know, it is, it is literally the lifeblood of everything we do is to be entrepreneurial. We need to sell pilots, we need to write scripts, we need to like, and it just, you literally just write and write and write until you die. And that's, by the way, that's the good version. <laughs> You were lucky. Hopefully we will all, I mean, you know, like people say, how do you want to die? I'm like, at my desk. That's how I want to die. You know, I don't want to die surrounded by happy people in a haze of morphine with some tumor eating my brain. I want to have a heart attack while I'm writing uh, the next kick-ass action sequence I got to do, you know? And, 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 you just, and you just have to embrace the fact that there is no million dollar script. There is no, I mean, maybe there will be, but it'll be one of 20. You know, you just keep writing because the, it, especially, and what that does, it prepares you for the writer's room because the iterative na na nature of improvement in writing is what, it, just like in life, is what it's about. You know, you write your first draft, it sucks, it's, it's a zany four camera, which, uh, it, you know, and then, uh, unless you're writing a zany four camera, in which case, great, you won. Um, and, then, and then you just keep, and the next draft gets better, the next draft, then you leave that project, you go to the next project, and you get better, you know? So, so regardless of what level of success you have, if you stop writing or if you only write when you have to, you stop growing. One of my favorite um, qualities in a TV writer is the ability to pivot. They, they pitch something and it, it doesn't work and they just pitch something else completely different. And it's, it's such a great, it, it, it's basically once your soul has been crushed enough, you don't, you don't connect. <laughs> you're, not, you're not as attached. Yeah, you're not attached to anything <laughs> or anymore. <this. laughs> but um, I think it's important in the writer's room, but it's also important just in writing, is you write something, you get so attached, and then you move on, and you write something else that you love, and you don't get so attached that you're 
feelings are hurt if that the one you wrote first isn't getting the attention you want. Unfortunately, I'm so sorry, Javi. We are all out of time for the panel. Uh, thank you, David, Liz, Rabia, and Javier. Thank for you, joining guys. Us today. Thank you guys very much. Thank you.